and welcome to today's Chrissy B Show. Well, today is all about the most predominant mental health problem worldwide, one that many of you and myself know about, that is depression. And here to help us understand exactly what depression is, what happens to us when we're depressed, as well as offering some techniques on how to manage it, is our resident psychologist, Dr. Audrey Tang. Then later on, I'll be hearing from Hayley Evans, who was in denial about her depression, but eventually sought the help she needed to recover. And with tragedy recently striking Grenfell Tower in West London, we're also joined by fire safety expert Mike Fleckley of Rapier Fire, who'll be giving me his top tips on fire prevention and also what to do in the event of a fire. Then as our good cause of the week, we feature Anna Kennedy of Anna Kennedy Online, who is the latest addition to our team of regular experts. She'll be joined by their young charity patron, Ryan Wiggins, who'll be telling us all about the success of Autism Scott Talent 2017. Now, as I mentioned earlier, depression is the single most common mental health problem worldwide, affecting 350 million people across the planet. In estimates by the World Health Organization, in 2013, depression was the second leading cause of years lived with disability worldwide, and a year later in the UK, nearly 20% of all people aged 16 or over showed symptoms of anxiety or depression. Now, one thing that people often find extremely difficult is to know how to describe depression. This is what the Mental Health Foundation have to say. Depression is a common mental disorder that causes people to experience depressed mood, loss of interest or pleasure, feelings of guilt or low self-worth, disturbed sleep or appetite, low energy and poor concentration. Well, as one might expect, there have been a lot said about this on Twitter, so let's take a look. Kaliza says, don't sleep on depression, it is not a joke. Rethink depression remind us of an overlooked fact. They say living with depression can make it difficult to solve even simple things. Common Sad Girl says that depression feeling when someone asks you what your hobbies are and you can't respond because you never have enough interest or energy to explore what you like. Injiyasha is being positive. She says to everyone who deals with depression and suicidal thoughts and drug addiction and anxiety, please know you are loved. And Vulnerable says, depression is when you don't really care about anything. Anxiety is when you care too much and overthink everything. Having both is hell. Well, thanks for your thoughts there. And to try and give us a bit of a clearer understanding on what depression is, is our resident psychologist, Dr. Audrey Tang. The majority of people who suffer from depression do explain it as feeling, feeling nothing or feeling a lethargy, feeling as if nothing matters, worthlessness. The DSM-5 will actually define it um, saying that you need to have more than five of the following symptoms, it, which includes things like uh, insomnia or hypersomnia, sleeping too much rather than not sleeping enough, uh, feelings of worthlessness, uh, dark thoughts, uh, not necessarily suicidal thoughts, but thoughts about death quite consuming thoughts. Um, all of those sorts of, that feeling of loneliness, that feeling of worthlessness, that sadness, that might be self-reported or it might be other people saying that you're, you're looking very tearful or it might be someone saying you're very irritable. Um, and also weight loss is another um, symptom of, of depression. Those are the feelings that a lot of people seem to demonstrate and also seem to talk about when they say they are depressed. It's not quite the same as just feeling sad. A lot of us do feel sad. A lot of us can feel extreme sadness as well but that's not quite the same as a clinical depressive episode. Thanks very much Audrey and stay tuned because we'll be catching up with some more of Audrey's tips later on in the show. But before that we are all aware of the tragic events that took place earlier this month at Grenfell Tower in West London and as a result many of us are understandably anxious about fire hazards and safety. So we have here fire safety expert Mike Fleckney who gives us his top tips on fire prevention and also what to do in the event of a fire. Hi Mike, thanks for speaking to us today. Hi Chrissy. So can you tell us about some of the basic things we should all know about um, safety for our home when it comes to fires? Yeah, there are, there are a number of top tips that everyone should follow in order to keep themselves safe in the home. Mm -hmm. First one, the biggie of course, is smoke alarms. Um, you need a smoke alarm on every level in your house. If you mm -hmm. can, you should have a heat, heat alarm in your kitchen. Uh, if you can do it, it's best if they're hardwired to the mains with a with a battery backup. Um, yeah. Second issue and another real biggie is to have an evacuation plan. Okay. You really need to 
plan your routes from each part of your house and especially from the bedrooms so everyone mm. knows exactly which way to leave the house or the flat and knows their way out and make sure that the front door doesn't have locks and bolts all over the place ideally just one lock mm -hmm. uh, without a key if you do have to have a key and i do in my house mm -hmm. then uh, leave it in the lock at night i have okay. a fluorescent uh, to fob on mine so I can find it in the dark if I have to. Okay, and this is something that you would get the children involved in as well, that they Absolutely. should all know, maybe to have a practice with them, Yeah, make you? it fun, but have a, have a practice. Put people in the beds, pretend there's a fire going on, and then make them leave under okay. their own steam and make them follow the way out. The next thing is have a nighttime routine. Make sure mm -hmm. as you go to bed every night, close all your internal doors, switch off all the unnecessary appliances, unplug appliances where you can, make sure the gas is off. If you've had candles or an open fire, make sure it's all properly extinguished. Mm -hmm. Next one is smokers. Make sure that uh, smokers are, are well controlled. Don't allow anyone to smoke in bed. If you have smokers in the house, yeah. make sure they use proper ashtrays mm -hmm. and keep an eye on any infirm people or, or anyone that likes to drink. Make sure you keep an eye on them. They're the ones that tend to be accident prone. Okay. The next one, everyone should know, if you've got gas in your house, have your gas system checked at least once a year by a gas a gas safe uh, contractor, mm -hmm. make sure they check the whole system out. Not so much about fire safety, more about carbon monoxide. We don't want people being asphyxiated in their own homes. Oh, just, just a question regarding that, because sometimes people are kind of concerned about the costs of these kind of things. Are these things that you can get done for free or is, it, is there a cost involved? There's a you? cost involved for the uh, for gas checks, certainly. Okay. But all the other things are, are, are fairly cheap. With regards to smoke alarms, the fire brigade will quite often come out and fit you smoke alarms for free. Oh, really? Uh, okay. They won't be hardwired, but they'll yeah. be... They'll be They'll, they'll do what you okay, need. Okay, that's good to know. Okay. Yeah. Any other prevention strategies? Yeah, if you live in a block of flats or a converted house, it's essential that the building has a fire risk assessment. Okay. There's got to be a current risk assessment in place. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be when you're appointing somebody, you need to make sure that they're a, a contractor with a third party accreditation. Mm -hmm. um, check the accreditations out and if you can, get references. It's essential that you know that the person doing the job knows what they're doing. Okay. And that will give you the plan for your your okay. building. So that's obviously the, the game sort of set up in case of a fire, but if there is an actual fire, what's the, what's the first thing you should do? Well, that goes back to having a plan. You, you mm -hmm. must have a plan in place. You must understand what it is. And it's going to vary according to the type of uh, building you live in. Mm -hmm. If you're in a house, then your plan will be quite straightforward. You'll, you'll have checked your routes. You'll have had everyone walk through it. And you will always plan to leave by using the stairs and the front door. But yeah. if something does go wrong, if, if you open the door and you find the smoke in the hallway, then you need to know how to get out of the, the first floor. Yeah. Most modern houses will have escape windows. You need to make sure everyone understands how to get out of the window, to lower mm -hmm. themselves, stretching their arms so that they have a minimum drop and then releasing themselves. These are not things I advise people to practice because you... Yeah, obviously, yeah, you can't, yeah. But you need it's to not getting everyone, broken bones everywhere. Yeah. Exactly, not, not promoting yeah. that. But everyone okay. needs to know what, what the methods are for their building. Okay. If you live in a block of flats or a converted house, the procedure is going to vary depending on, on, on the building. Mm -hmm. The fire risk assessment or the uh, strategy for the building will, will be set in place. You should know whether it's a stay put policy, which we've heard so much about in recent yeah. years, or whether it's a simultaneous evacuation. If the policy is for simultaneous evacuation, there will be an alarm in the building and you'll leave. Okay. If the policy is for um, a stay put, there probably won't be an alarm system and you need, need to stay in your flat. That's mm. why the fire risk assessment is key, because if you have the wrong strategy and the wrong sort yeah. of building, uh, unfortunately we know now how badly okay. wrong that can go. Yeah. Uh, Mike, <clears> as well, if, for example, in terms of the smoke, obviously that is the, the killer, obviously just the smoke itself, never mind the fire, but what would, how do you protect yourself from that? Say if you know, the building is full of smoke and you can't see very, what can you do? If you do find yourself in a room that's, that has smoke in it, then you need to get down as low as you possibly can, get as close okay. to the floor as you can. Yeah. Uh, and there should be fresh air there to breathe. It's going to be awkward getting out. Um, yeah, yeah. Again, depending on the type of building, you may make your way to the door or a window and try and escape that way. Mm -hmm. If you're stuck in a room and you, you really can't get out, then put wet towels, wet cloths, something across the bottom, try and uh, try and keep the smoke out of your room as much as possible. Make your on way the floor, you mean to put the... Yeah, okay. yeah make your way to a window yeah. and make yourself known to, to the fire brigade or anyone outside so they know where you are and they know where okay. to rescue you from. So Mike, if people want more information about the you know safety precautions, things like that, where could they go? Oh, there's plenty of information out there. The first mm -hmm. port of call should be your local fire brigade. Contact your local fire station and they'll be happy to give you advice and they'll even come out and fit smoke alarms. Um, your local fire service will also have a website and there'll be masses of information on there and there'll be plenty of information about fire safety in the home. Brilliant. It'll give you all the top tips. It'll tell you how to deal with your local fire brigade and all procedures you need to follow in your home. Brilliant. Mike, thank you so much. Chris, thank it's you. a pleasure. Thank you.
Well, thanks very much to Mike there. And now let's turn our attention to Hayley Evans, tonight's real life story guest, who's here to share her experiences with depression. Let's take a look. Yeah, I, it, I went through a lot of different experiences. Um, and most recently I had a big climax um, in probably about eight months ago when everything came out. I think that I was probably depressed for about four years beforehand, but never actually admitted it to myself. I had a boyfriend um, once who was depressed and that was a really hard time. And I was told myself that I wouldn't ever want to put anybody else through that. Um, and so then when I was feeling like I might be depressed, it took me a long time to kind of come out and say it. And it wasn't until um, everything just got on top of me that it actually did and I admitted it to myself and to other people and went to the doctors and then everything kind of, as I say, really climaxed. Everyone suddenly rallied around and um, I was going to the doctors and I was getting therapy and I was going to counselling and it was quite overwhelming but really supportive as well because uh, it actually got to the point where I couldn't go to work anymore. Um, I would be at work and I was feeling sad but I could kind of shake it off and then it got to the point where I'd have to sort of take myself to the toilet, have a little cry and then come back to my desk and then I couldn't get to the toilet and I just had to stay at my desk and keep it in and just cry to myself at my desk and then it got to the point where everyone knew and almost every other day I had people in my office comforting me and and trying to reason with me and I think that's when I kind of thought this isn't normal. <laughs> I, I did think I, you know, people say to you all the time when you've got kids, so oh, you're really busy and it's really hard and you're always in demand and all that kind of thing and you've got to work and cook dinners and all this kind of thing and so you kind of are like, oh well this just must be the norm, but it's not normal to cry all the time and have a constant lump in your throat like you're going, you're on the edge all the time and anything, however small, can tip you over. So we're going to be hearing more from Hayley a bit later on, but now let's return to Audrey, who tells us here how we can help ourselves when feeling depressed. If, you, if someone's feeling depressed, one of the best things to do is, first of all, try and distract yourself, but that may not be possible. The whole problem with depression is that uh, you often catastrophize thoughts, you have negative automatic thoughts, so it might be that, for example, something negative happens to you, you might trip over or you might fail a test or you might not get a job, and that can spiral into something much more, um, much more major than that. It can be, oh, I didn't get that job, that means I'm worthless, that means nobody likes me, that means I'm not valuable, I'll never get another job. That's catastrophizing. And if you're in that sort of state, it can be quite difficult to distract yourself out of it. It's one thing I might suggest is, a sort of physical change in your environment, really just taking yourself outside, getting a bit of sunlight, playing with a pet, something like that, if you can distract yourself physically. Otherwise, if you are having very dark thoughts, speak to someone, the Samaritans, it's always very important to, to have that number on hand in order to, to give somebody a call to just to talk to. Because it might be that you decided not, you don't want to talk to your friends and you don't want to talk to those around you. Another problem is when we're feeling depressed, we may refuse invitations. We may say to people, oh, I don't feel like going out. I don't want to go out tonight. And people can stop asking. Now, this may be out of respect for our wishes. After all, we've told them we don't want to go out. However, if we refuse those invitations enough, they may also stop asking. So it's also important for other people to remember, even if you've been knocked back a couple of times, if you know someone is depressed, don't stop asking. In fact, change what you're asking them. Um, ask them if you could make them dinner that evening or you want to spend some time together. Those things will allow that person to be able to be a little bit distracted from their, in, their inside thoughts, the thoughts that are going on in their head. But also, that connection is really important too. Another thing, but this is a bit of a bugbear of mine, is try and get off social media. There's nothing great about looking and comparing yourself and the way you are living your life with 
really the best highlights of other people's. People only put on what they want you to see on social media and a lot of that is filtered, a lot of that is the best bits. So try not to compare yourself to switch off social media. After the break, we'll be hearing another of Audrey's tips. I'll be hearing how Hayley Evans is dealing with her depression and I'll be watching a video courtesy of the Mental Health Channel which shows how depression can hit just about anyone. But the key fact being there is always light at the end of the tunnel. But first, a question for you. How many more people suffer from depression now than in 1945? Is it A, five times, B, seven times or C, ten times? I'll give you the right answer right after this break. to the Chrissy B Show everyone, your TV program for all things mental health and well-being. Now before the break I asked you how many more people suffer from depression now than in 1945. Is it A, five times more, B, seven times more or C, ten times more? The answer is C, unfortunately ten times more people suffer from major depression now than 70 years ago. Well now let's hear from Hayley Evans again who now tells me how she identifies the cause of her depression. I think it was a gradual build-up. Um, it sounds really silly. <laughs> I'm only 30, but when I turned 30, I did have a. I think I did have a little bit of a, a crisis. Um, I think at that age, everyone in your life, with your friends, are all in different positions. So I've got kids, but my friends' other friends don't have kids. Different people are buying different houses or at different points in their career, and I felt like a bit of a failure. Um, and then people would say to me, oh, but you've got your kids, you're, you know, you've, you've achieved loads because you've got your kids. And then I felt pressure that my kids were going to be my success story. So I had to put a lot of effort sort of into them. And um, I think it was, it was the failure thing for me. I felt like I had really failed and I couldn't see past what I had. And in my line of work, I work in a cancer hospital. So I'm, I'm working with patients who are getting bad news every day, who, who are you know, having the worst time of their lives, their family are having the worst time of their lives. And I still felt the way that I felt. And I felt so guilty for feeling how I felt because I had kids, I've got a really supportive family, really supportive boyfriend, really, really supportive mother. I've got a mortgage, I'm employed. On paper, I've got nothing to be sad about or depressed about. I still felt the way I did and so the guilt on top of that just made it ten times worse because I felt guilty for feeling the way I felt when to a lot of people I have everything. And stay tuned because we'll be hearing more from Hayley later on in the show. Well, if you're worried about a loved one who might be feeling depressed, here are some tips from Audrey now on how we can help those who might be in need. The things I've mentioned before is it's really important to remember that if you do get knocked back a few times, don't give up. A lot of the time when somebody is depressed, they don't want to go out because they don't actually want other people asking them what's wrong, that, that brings them down. And it can also mean that they feel as if everybody's looking at them. And so there are reasons why people may not want to go out. So it might be a case of, arranging to spend time with them to do something practical. Something to remember about depression is when someone's depressed they find it very hard to take care of themselves personally as well. So even something is a little or it seems little to you, maybe painting someone's nails or doing their hair, that can actually make a huge difference as well. Cooking them a healthy meal because sometimes they will forget to eat and certainly forget to eat healthily. So those are some of the practical things that we can do. Other things that you can do when that person isn't suffering a depressive episode is actually go out, enjoy the sunshine, get some exercise, look after your diet, look after your nutrition. All of those things, all of the tips that you have on your show, Chrissy, all of those are so important for daily living as much as when you're suffering something uh, with regards to mental health. Well, now I wanted to show you this video courtesy of the Mental Health Channel, which shows how depression can hit just about anyone. But no matter who you are, there is always a light at the end of the tunnel. I 
I'm Julie Hirsch. I'm an author and a speaker. I wrote a book called Struck by Living, and it's about my personal story with clinical depression. We are going to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and we're going to hike up to the point where I attempted suicide in 2001. I'm going with my son Daniel, who's 20 years old. I haven't really talked to him too much about this story. He knows about it, of course, because he's seen me write the book and he knows I give speeches about this, but we've never talked personally about this story. And so this will be a good time for us to do it. I do and don't want to know more about her struggles because as a family member and my own mental well-being, I do want to know, but I don't want to know because it's disturbing stuff and she's my mom and I'd like to think that she wants to be around my life permanently. I like it here so much is it's quiet, it's green. For me, I feel like green is really a healing color. I love the sound of the water at night when I'm sleeping. I love the light through the aspen leaves, especially in the late afternoon. And it's a great place for me to write and reconnect with my family. I'm going with Daniel on this so that he can have a broader awareness for himself. Is telling Daniel my story more difficult than publishing the book? I think it is harder if my own son rejects me because of this information. Sure, that would hurt. You want to drive? There was about nine months that I went through a very, very severe depression. I would lose weight, I couldn't sleep, and I just lost my desire to do any of the things that I love to do. And I really thought if I returned to Santa Fe that maybe something would shift. And I got here and I felt exactly the same way. Is this the exact path you took in 2001? Yeah, pretty much. We're retracing the steps of what I did that day. It was a different type of day. It looked totally different. Gray sky, it's rainy, cold. I actually wrote in my journal that I was looking forward to taking a hike so that if they found the body, they would think that it was an accident. I have a great marriage, two healthy kids, we're financially set. It has nothing to do with how much that you have. Depression is definitely an equal opportunity disease. So how would you act if I were diagnosed with it? Um, as long as you manage it, it's really not that big of a deal. So if you pay attention to things like sleep, exercise, nutrition, and stress management. Meditation is something that I've actually added fairly recently. It's remarkable how much calmer I am and how much more I can keep life in perspective. Depression was a numbness. It was a disconnection. I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't feel joy or anger or pain. I felt like I was a ghost in my body. I remember most of what was going on at that time, but there was never like a point where I was like, this is a big deal. Like my mom like could literally die tomorrow if she wanted to. At the point that I was walking up the mountain, there was just a compulsion to die. die. I told myself things like, you don't deserve to be here. You don't deserve to be Your here. kids would be better off. They can have another mother. They can have another somebody, mother. Better. somebody better. You're never gonna get better. You're never gonna get better. You're never gonna get better. I remember standing at the edge and looking down and thinking, this isn't gonna work. I'm gonna bounce off this rock, this rock, and then I'll end up paralyzed and depressed. But if I were paralyzed, then I wouldn't be able to kill myself the thought that she was going to leave us forever, that she didn't love us. Looking back, if she had succeeded, that would have been like probably the hardest pill to swallow. I 
think the most difficult question that anybody can ask someone who's attempted suicide is, why didn't you love me enough? I hope I can do a good enough job of explaining that this is a disease and it has nothing to do with my love for him. And the reality is, now that I'm managing my depression, I have a great life. And most of my life has been a great life, except for this very small period of time. <laughs> I just didn't want you to feel like you wanted to reject me because you didn't want to be anything like Nick because of this disease. Hmm. That thought's never crossed my mind. I would love to be like you <laughs> when I'm older. I'm really proud that you've been able to, you know, overcome this and dedicate your life to this cause. I'm just glad I didn't miss it. Me too. If I had completed that suicide, I would have missed the last 14 years, which have really been some of the best years of my life. I've gotten to see my kids grow up into beautiful people. I've got to travel all over the world. So for the people who may be hopeless, your life may have that potential as well, but you have to stick around long enough to find out. So thank you very much to the Mental Health Channel for that video. And if you want to know more about them, do head over to the website, chrissybshow.tv, and click on our contributors section. Now, before we go to break, let's catch up with Hayley, who tells me here more about her lowest moment. I really struggled um, to, to keep everything in. So it wasn't just a kind of mental, the way I was feeling inside, but it was very physical. So for me, I'd get big like pins and needles in my hand and, it, and I developed this um, kind of habit of really grinding my hands together. And it got to the point where I had um, big open sores on, on my hands where my nails had dig, dug, dug in so much and I didn't I didn't realize I was doing it but it was like a sort of coping me mechanism I think when I was feeling anxious and I was getting shaky this kind of felt made me feel a bit grounded and comforted and it eventually <laughs> wore away at my hands and I, and I had these big really really sore kind of welts in my hand and it stopped me from doing it because it hurt too much to do it and so they healed but that was a really bad time um i got very very upset once in the supermarket because <laughs> i forgot my bank card and couldn't pay and i'd forgotten my sunglasses so i was wearing my daughter's hello kitty tiny sunglasses that didn't even cover my face but i can't drive without the sunglasses on so i had these tiny sunglasses on and then i couldn't pay for my food and then i just burst out crying in front of a line full of people and the cashier and i had all my own bags so i had to tip all the food out as well and it was just it was a so it was a really em embarrassing moment but any i just think anybody else would have just bought out and then come and you know oh I've got my bank card but it was it was the worst thing and it, and for the rest of the day i was in tears because of a tiny little mistake leaving my bank card at home um you kind of walking around thinking, oh, but everyone knows why I'm like this because I'm, I'm depressed, but people don't know. And so it's really, it's really hard to, to keep in. And um, yeah, so that was a pretty low moment for me. 
Well, stay tuned because after the break, I'll be catching up with our Good Cause of the Week, Anna Kennedy of Anna Kennedy Online, on the work that she is doing in raising awareness for autism. And she'll be joined by their young charity patron, Ryan Wiggins. But before that, what is the average age of the first onset of major depression? Is it A, 20 to 24, B, 25 to 29, or C, 30 to 35? Have a think, and I'll let you know right after this break. Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10pm on my channel Sky203. Visit ChrissyBshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page The Chrissy B Show. to the Chrissy B Show everyone where today has been all about depression. Now before the break I asked you what is the average age of the first onset of major depression? Is it A 20 to 24, B 25 to 29 or C 30 to 35? The answer is B between the ages of 25 and 29. Well now it's time to move on to our good cause of the week and this week we feature Anna Kennedy online and here we have founder Anna Kennedy and young charity patron Ryan Wiggins discussing some of the work that they are doing and after that we have some highlights from their Autism's Got Talent event. Hi Chrissy and Chrissy B viewers, um, so excited to be here on our very first regular contribution to talk about autism. Um, this is Ryan, Ryan's one of my charity patrons, he's been with us for about three years now Ryan yeah, would you three say? three years yeah. And he's going to be talking about how his life has changed since he's been working with the charity and I'm so excited that we're going to be able to talk about the world of autism. I'm the founder of Anna Kennedy Online and it started in 2009 and it was because parents were writing to me about the difficulties that they were having with diagnosis, trying to find the right type of school um, and then once they got to adulthood. We have been working with um, people across the country and we've also got regular events. We provide training, we have a helpline and we're only a small charity and we have a small group of volunteers but we work really hard, don't we Ryan? Oh yeah. So Ryan, um, Autumn's Got Talent, you were on our, one of our very first um, programmes and um, what would you say, how has your life has changed? I mean it's completely changed my life for the better. Um, it, since 2014 when I uh, took part in Autism's Got Talent, um, I've been uh, joining in so many of uh, Anna Kennedy Online's events um, which has led to me becoming a charity patron in 2015 um, and since then I've um, I've been able to run the charity's YouTube channel, which has given me a lot of experience in both filmmaking and uh, just interviewing people, and it's just been amazing for me to you know joining all the events. Uh, I also won a Diana Award um, in 2016, as well as the uh, British Citizen Youth Award, uh, which also led to me getting uh, the opportunity to go to India, uh, which was life changing. Um, so. Everything that has come with the charity has been amazing for me. Thank you. Can you just talk a little bit about how it was for you before Autism's Got Talent, um, when, once you got the diagnosis of autism? Um, so, not to be uh, too down in the dumps about it, but uh, life was you know, fairly difficult. Um, I was having a lot of bad experiences at school, um, namely bullying, um, people like just you know, being quite harassive and uh, being, you know, feeling sort of isolated um, and, you know, things weren't really great and for a long time I didn't really understand why um, and it wasn't really until I had the diagnosis that I kind of had an answer to why I was so different to all these people. Um, however, just being diagnosed, it doesn't give you everything. It doesn't give you the answer to all your problems, um, which, um, you know, I found quite difficult because I wanted, you know, it, it didn't really give me, you know, anything else to do. It just gave me an answer as to why I was so different. Um, like, you know, for example, it didn't give me um, any other outlook. It didn't give me any, any, anywhere else to go. Um, it didn't give me, you know, yeah, a lot of parents, they fight for the diagnosis and then once they get the diagnosis, they think that everything's going to fall in their lap, don't they? But it, it's not like that at all. You've got to fight the system and you've got to really push to get the right support for your son or your daughter. 
Um, so um, autumn's got talent. We just sort of go back to that. Um, there's a lot of children and adults that appear on autumn's got talent that have been bullied, that were like yourself, and they turn to the performing arts to help them more or less to get through their ordeal. So, you, did you start singing first, or did you start playing the guitar, or what did you do first? For me, yeah, it was uh, it was singing and uh, sort of playing guitar that came. Um you know, naturally as a you know, a little bit of an add-on. Um, so yeah, I've been singing and playing guitar, you know, for a, as long as I can remember um, and playing guitar since I was about 10, um, so six years now. Um, yeah, performance, performing arts has always been, you know, a big part of my life. Uh, you know, it, way before I joined the charity, I was uh, taking part in amateur productions, uh, things like Bugsy Malone and, you know, little plays here and there, um, which was, you know, it, it gave me something to do. Um, you know, whenever I was having a difficult time at school, I always had, you know, that to fall back on. Um, I've had quite a lot of parents since starting Autumn's Got Talent that have written to me about them struggling trying to find out of school clubs. Um, a couple of parents are writing me saying that they wanted their daughter or their son to um, participate in a, a dance club or a sports club, and they were turned away um, because of their condition. So I decided um, to run a survey and it's only been going a couple of weeks and I had a look at the survey and I, I want the survey to continue and I just um, just a couple of results here of how it's going at the moment so as I said there was recently many parents that have contacted me via the charity website and social media because we have quite a big presence on social media on Twitter and on um, Facebook and I wanted to see how widespread across the UK this was happening to families um, since the you know Autumn's Got Talent you can see how amazing a lot of these children and adults are so 250 families so far have filled out the survey and questions I asked was has your child ever been turned away from a local club performing arts class sports facility or a leisure environment due to their autism and over 50% of the 250 that have participated so far have said yes and added this has made them feel very upset and isolated not only as a family but as an individual and I asked does your child have a hobby or a talent and over 70% of them said that they had and I asked what kind of hobbies they were into and it was um, things ranged from dancing, Minecraft, playing the keyboard, loving making videos, horse riding, sailing, golf, computer games and programming. So I find that really really sad that you know that there's children out there that want to join clubs because obviously autism is a social interaction and communication they have difficulties with it so something like performing arts or whatever it is that they want to do why shouldn't they be able to join and I was speaking to my husband who's our legal advisor and he said the, Equ the Equality Act actually came into force in October 2010 and clubs no matter how big or even if they're just a group a voluntary group they should certainly not refuse to allow children to join simply because they have a disability and at the very at the very least they should look at what reasonable adjustments they can make because I know um, with my son he's in a course and just the smallest adjustment by putting a fan on his table and sitting at the front because he hasn't got those surrounding um, how can I say uh, sensory difficulties that he has he's able to concentrate so if you just make a small adjustment and you know what I think you should do is we're going to be highlighting Autism's Got Talent on the show and you really should watch it and just see how talented these individuals are and how passionate they are and it's not only what happens on stage it's what happens behind stage isn't it Ryan it's just like people are making friends oh, yeah. families are making contacts the you know sleepovers even girlfriend and boyfriend type of thing so it's just like why shouldn't our children have the opportunity to join an after school club and for me um, I, I want to really pursue this and um, see you know how many more families and I'm trying to find out you know where are autism friendly clubs across the country so as soon as I have that information we'll be sharing it on our charity website so there might be somewhere near to you that your daughter or son might be able to join so Ryan um, obviously June and July is the months for exams <laughs> so you've been sitting some uh, GCSEs do you want to tell everybody um, what exams you've been doing and um, when you leave college where are you going to be going um, so yeah, I've just literally just finished um, like my last exams this week. Uh, it's the whole exam season. It's sort of laid bored as very stressful and uh, something that you know people will get really worked out, uh, worked up about. Um, but the thing is, I think it's really important that people remember that exams, you know, they are literally just exams. You know, while that you know they matter in careers and everything they're not, you know, they're not the thing that define you, you know, your character and everything, that's what defines you. Um, but I've been, you know, I've been doing my core, you know, uh, 
English, maths and science. Um, and I've also been doing media, hospitality and photography, um, you know, very broad subjects, but again, quite creative, um, you know, which is something that a lot of people here on the spectrum really. So what's happening in September? What do you aspire, to, where do you aspire to go to? So yeah, I'm hoping to go on to uh, college and, you know, study media. Um, like I said, something that, you know, a lot of, it, it's a very creative subject, so, you know, very, you know, so you're Sorry. excited? Were you excited about it? You think? Or, oh yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Really can't wait to leave school, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I yeah very excited to you know go into college and you know it. I think it just shows that anyone you know can go into any kind of career they want, any kind of you know college they want, university. As long as you put in the effort, you know you can get there. Okay. Well, well Ryan, I, th I think you're an aspiring role model, and um, I'm sure your mom is very very proud of you. In fact, I know your mom is very proud of you and um, that's why we have you as our young charity patron and that's what we try to do in the charity um, a lot of our patrons and charity champions and ambassadors are actually role models for the charity and a lot of them are autistic themselves so it's to give hope and um, you know light at the end of the tunnel for family so i wanted to say thank you uh, to chrissy for giving me this opportunity and look forward to our next segment After the break, I'll be hearing more of Hayley's journey with depression and I'll be giving you my top tips on how to cope with depression. But first, by 2020, depression will be the second most disabling condition in the world. Behind what? Is it A, lung cancer, B, heart disease or C, dementia? Tune in after the break to find out the answer. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show everyone, the TV program that looks after your mental health and well-being. Now before the break I asked you by 2020, depression will be the second most disabling condition in the world behind what? Is it A, lung cancer, B, heart disease or C, dementia? The answer is B, heart disease. Well here Audrey gives us her final tip on how we can distinguish depression from sadness. Let's take a look. Whilst it's likely that everybody will experience sadness and sometimes extreme sadness during the course of their lives, it does not necessarily mean it's a depressive episode. There are huge differences between the two. It's perfectly normal for people to feel very down, certainly after bereavement, after loss, and those things are a natural part of life. However, when it comes to feeling worthless, feeling nothingness, feeling lethargy, insomnia or hypersomnia, all of those things that I've mentioned earlier for a longer period of time and you've begun to notice it, they've begun to notice it, maybe even their children, other loved ones have noticed it, that's when you do need to suggest them getting help. Thank you very much to Audrey for all her tips today. So now we can return to Hayley Evans who tells me about what life is like for her now. 
well, I'm back at work. Um, I feel a lot happier. I wouldn't say that I'm 100% there, and I definitely wouldn't say that I can't see myself having to work hard to keep myself where I am. Um, I think a lot of my sort of recovery is down to family. I've got a really supportive family. My mum is amazing. She has been there for me through everything. Looking after the kids, giving me sort of time to myself, giving me, giving me time to relax and try and find where my head needs to be. Um, on a practical level, I, um, I started off with a bit of counselling and um, while I waited for the CBT to come through, so that's a cognitive behavioural therapy and I went for um, low mood management and that was just through the GP. I turned up at the group and I just looked around because it was a, it was a group therapy and I just thought none of these people are like me, nobody's going to know how I'm sort of feeling. Everyone was different ages and then as we sort of started talking, it, everything kind of slipped into place and there were other people that you know felt like me which in itself is, is a comfort. Um, they, they teach you um, coping mechanisms, they teach you different ways of thinking. I think it's a really good thing to have even if you don't have any kind of sort of issues because it just helps you with everyday life and it just really um, kind of spoke to me and I found myself doing things without realising that they taught us. So one of the things that they taught us was to sort of find a happy, um, something that makes you happy, something that you enjoy doing. So for some people it might be reading or running or any, anything like that. Um, for me, I really like sort of crafting and um, making things and sewing. So I kind of threw myself into that. And a few of my friends, um, have, they've said to me for a while, but I, I I haven't really taken them up on it. They said that I should um, vlog and do like little videos. So I, um, you know, was like, oh, I don't know. Nobody's going to be interested. And they're like, do it, do it. Just do one. So I, I did one and I made a Christmas wreath for the, your front door. And um, I filmed myself doing it and it was quite enjoyable. I completely had forgotten about how I was feeling. Um, and then I had to edit it, so then I was like, uh, editing it, and it was it was really it was really enjoyable. And one of the things that they teach you is when you start to ruminate, when you start to think about the, how you feel and how your and how your um, your mind is working and everything's going through it, to take yourself off and find your happy um, thing that you like to do. And for me, that meant I could just pick up my phone when I started to think and things started to go wrong in my head, and edit a video and it would, I'd get lost in it. And before I, before I knew it, two hours had gone by and I hadn't thought about the things that I usually think about every five minutes or things that are constantly on my mind. And that was, it, re it did really help. It really sort of took me out of my situation and made me do things that I enjoy, which was part of the reason why I think I got to where I was because I didn't have the time to do the things that I you know, wanted to do or enjoy. So I've kind of given myself a new mantra, which is uh, be kind to yourself. And, you know, when I was going through, I had to, like a bit of an OCD phase where everything had to be tidy and I couldn't sit down because everything had to be tidy. And now I can sit down and just sort of say, be kind to yourself and watch telly rather than spend three hours t tidying and cleaning everything. And I feel so much better for it because I feel like I've, I've got to know myself so much more and learn what I enjoy and because I've had to find it to get myself out of that place and so now I'm giving myself time to do the things I enjoy rather than the things that I don't necessarily have to do or aren't necessary at all and yeah I think that's quite a key for me. So thank you very much to Hayley there. So now it's time for some tips on how you can cope with depression if this is your situation at the moment. So the first very important tip is actually to stay in touch. So it's very important that you don't actually withdraw from life, even though you might feel like not doing anything or not speaking to people because you feel in that kind of mood. It's really, really important to kind of push yourself still and keep in touch with friends and family so that you do have someone to talk to.
My second point is also to be more active. So this, you know, being active can help with so many things, but especially with depression. So make sure if you were exercising before that you continue exercising, even if you don't feel like it, or maybe if you weren't much of a person to exercise and you do start to feel quite low, then it's probably a good idea to actually take up a bit of exercise or do something that, that you know, is not too difficult and something that you enjoy. The third point is to face your fears. So. It's very tempting sometimes to actually avoid the things that you find difficult, but that's actually sometimes the worst thing you can do. So when generally when people feel low or anxious, they sometimes avoid talking to other people and it can actually make them lose their confidence. So do, you know, do keep in touch, do, do, you know, do carry on and, and keep in touch with the world. The fourth point, which is very, very important, is don't drink too much alcohol. Now, I remember when I was depressed, I used to try and... and it would help, I thought alcohol would actually help me to sleep. And it did kind of make me a bit woozy and I did sleep, but it didn't actually uh, solve the issue. And um, I think also people are in danger of actually becoming addicted to alcohol, especially when they are depressed. So make sure that you aren't, um, okay, obviously it's good, it's, it's okay for people to have a drink uh, in a social occasion, but don't use it to, to try and alleviate any symptoms that you're feeling because it really doesn't work. Also on the show that we do like to talk a lot about eating healthily. So it is very important to eat a healthy diet. So some people don't actually feel like eating when they're depressed or actually they even overeat. But it's very, very important that you actually um, try to keep nutrition going well for you. So don't, don't just eat, start eating junk and uh, not care about what you're eating because it does actually affect your mood. And finally, like, what I'd like to say about depression is that, um, you know, it's important that you do something about it. There are lots of tips online. You can find so many people talking about depression when actually uh, a lot of the, the advice sometimes that I hear is trying to kind of um, avoid issues in a sense. So yes, it's important to exercise. Yes, it's very important to look after your health and what you're eating. Yes, it's important to keep in touch with friends and family. All of those things are very good tips, but you can't rely on those things to solve your issue with depression. It's very, very important that you actually tackle the root cause of what you're going through and you learn how to fight it as well. Don't accept depression as, you know, I always say on this program, don't accept depression as something normal, something that is supposed to be there, something that you, maybe you say, oh, this is me. It's not you. Depression is not you and you are not depression. And I think as soon as you actually realize that, you will have more strength inside of you to actually go against it and fight it. I overcame depression, I overcame other mental health issues and you can read all about that on my website which is mylifeafterdepression.com. Until next time guys, bye bye for now.